A good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for another edition of Wow's Alive with a special guest and our host, Ned Dennison. Ned. Hello, everyone. I'm the chairperson of the International Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame. We have an honoree with us today, James Kegley. James, uh, normally we ask people about their swimming background and how they got into all of this, but uh, I think I kind of half know the answer. You were at Indiana University where our honoree Doc Councilman was coaching, became the oldest man to do the English Channel, and some guy named Kinsla, who seemed to do reasonably well with the word dominate in a few years after that. Tell us about that experience at Indiana and how these guys kind of got you into the open water. Well, yeah, I swam for Doc Councilman before college as well. I was out there in the summers um, and then, uh, you know, kind of started when John Kinsella was still uh, competing in college and he was one of my sort of heroes, I guess you could say. Um, of, I'm like, wow, that guy's, you know, he's, <laughs> he's large and in charge. And uh, I swam a four mile lake swim up in Huntington, Indiana with him when I was like 12 or 13. And he was in either college or high school, but he was already the man. And uh, so then, you know, cut to, I was at training in the summers and I was swimming in a lane next to Kinsella and he, you know uh, he was just you know, demolishing me I think I, I uh sprinted warm up and was close to him because he was probably just loafing the whole thing and he looked at me goes I think it's the first time he ever addressed me he goes oh it looks like you're catching me and you know that was the, a big moment in my life I'm like oh I'm catching him you know which clearly I wasn't and uh so, uh, you know, cut to I'm in college and I'm reading in Swimming World and Doc's telling me, oh, look, Kinsella's doing these long distance races, it's the craziest thing, you know, he's down in Argentina swimming or wherever. And I'd read in Swimming World and he, and I think Sandra Buca had done the 24 hour Latouk swim and, you know, all these things that just seemed um, amazing, adventurous and preposterous to me. I'm like, who, who does that? You know, I swam a mile and that was considered long distance, you know? and uh, but it, but it was intriguing. And then Doc decided to swim the, be, he wanted to, at the time, be the oldest man to swim the English Channel at 59 years old in 1979. And he's like, hey, why don't you come sit in a boat with me while, you know, drive a little boat at Lake Monroe. I want to swim for eight hours and do my first continuous swim. So I'm like, all right, you know, he's my coach. I'll do that. And I sat in his boat with no idea how to drive this little uh, putt-putt thing and no idea where I was going. It was... Uh, with my coach, who I was uh, always in somewhat awe of. So uh, that was fun. Yeah, that was fun. And that was like, oh, you know, maybe maybe I should do these. I, I've never had a strong sort of drive to be in a business or anything like that. So I was, even then, I'm, I was more driven by adventure, I think. And so I'm like, well, maybe I'll do that after college for a little while or at least a year and see what that's all about. And I did, yeah. So back in those days, you, you had to meet the, 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 special, um, the special application form and the special requirements. How did, how did you manage to sweet talk your way into that, that group? Oh, yeah, into the uh, professional, World Professional Marathon Swimming Association, I think it was called back then, um, <clears throat> which was, you know, a loosely organized but hard to get into. You had to have so many points to get into the, the regular circuit, but you could swim some races and not others. And I honestly don't even know what the formula was, but um, I know that Paul and I both got into Atlantic City as our first race. Um, and we got one, two in that. And uh, yeah, so that sort of got us entree into I don't know if the next race was Latouk. I think it might have been. And that was the 24-hour swim. Most of the other swimmers were boycotting that because whatever. They were, they were uh, I don't know. If, I can't remember what the issues were. Money or something. Money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, money. So Paul and I, though, for us, this was new. And we're like, well, let's we talked about it should we should we should we you know, stay the boycott but they're not these they weren't making it easy to get into the other races um they were like, oh you're not really qualified for magog and lake st john and all these other things so we're like well okay then let's we'll do that race and so we did that race with the idea of winning it and and uh maybe trying to break the record because that paid 500 more dollars <laughs> and uh you know and we were 
what, 20 years or 21 years old or something, 22, whatever we were after college. And um, so we, we decided to do that. And that was fun. And that was, uh, fun's probably the wrong word, but um, I couldn't, I mean, after Atlantic City, luckily it was two weeks or three weeks after Atlantic City. I honestly couldn't even lift my arms for a week after Atlantic City. Um, I got off the airplane and my friends had to come get me because I couldn't pick my bags up. And, um, you know, that was a that was an eye-opening experience about how not to go out too fast. But it was, um, so yeah, we at Latouf and we did that. And then Paul was pretty good about, and he always has been about sort of reaching out. And this, this guy from one of the local papers, the, like a big Quebec paper came and interviewed us. And he's like, hey, you know, he started talking to the guy maybe you could, maybe you could say, hey, what about these other races? Aren't they going to let the, the two fastest swimmers in? And so uh, kind of shame them a little bit, but, um, and that worked. So then we got in, we had to qualify for Lake St. John. I remember we had, like three days before we had to do a 10K swim and, uh, and there was a lot of who's going to win. So Paul and I just kind of said, well, let's, let's just win that and tie. So we did. And, um, just to sort of ease that, but it was uh, it was interesting because yeah, we had we had to work to get in to these races, but we did. And then after that, we had enough points for the next year, so we were fine. <laughs> but when we talked to Paul, he um, he made a confession about Latouk. He said, "You guys had agreed kind of three laps each around a third of a, so a mile each, and and you know rotate like the you know professional wrestling is the best description I come up with." And he confessed it at like three or four o'clock in the morning when it was cold and he was cold. He was kind of hiding as you came in for the third lap and forced you to do four. Um, and I think, I think he still feels pretty guilty about it, and, and, and as he should. So I guess my question is, you know, did you know it? Did you question him? Did he deny it? And has he been buying you drinks for the last 25 years to kind of make up for it? Uh, I'll just, I'll say no to all of it, but he, uh, he, um, I don't, until you mentioned that and he, I watched the interview, I had actually sort of forgotten that little detail. Um, so I know I haven't really dwelled on that part. Um, it does, it does ring a bell. I remember we were writing notes to each other, which was, uh, I wish we had because they were, I think it was pretty funny because we were we didn't know what we were doing. You know, we we're like, well, let's just swim fast for 24 hours in the 60 degree water. It was cold. I remember that. And I do remember us having some discussion in notes back and forth about, um, about that, about sort of, do we, uh, should we try to give each other more of a break? I didn't remember that he did four and I did, you know, or that I did four. And then he, cause he was like, no way. But I do remember going, yeah, you're right. Four is, we had already gotten so used to just swimming three laps is 21 minutes, I think, and getting out that the mental aspect of, well, let's just change it up. But, you know, one thing about these, these races was um, you sort of learned, we didn't know yet, but uh, that things change during the day. And it's just, you know, you got to focus on the fact that you'll be done in 24 hours <laughs> um and that, that, that's very comforting to many people listening yeah just another 23 and a half hours to go yeah. it'll be fine you yeah, don't worry well that was four in the morning and i think i saw his interview too and he, he it was it was interesting because there were bands playing and it was all you know a lot of activity out there and they were obviously focused on that and the beers was sponsor up there a lot so you know people were having a pretty good time and then all of a sudden at like four in the morning or whatever it was three there was a couple of people stumbling around at the edges of the lake, but, but other than that, um, there's no one there, a couple of officials. And so, and you'd go inside, you'd get out, you'd tag the hand of your, your, your partner there and Paul, and you go inside and, and lay down and shiver and maybe have a donut hole. I remember just uh, our trainer was Sylvia. She was great. Um, trainer, she's a local person who helped us out and, uh, and we'd be writing each other notes and, uh, yeah, and like, see what, what's their experience, and then shiver for twenty one minutes, and then jump back in, and uh, so yeah. But I don't, I don't dwell on the, the fourth lap. But now that you've brought it up, maybe I'll, I'll uh, reach I, out. I'd cash it in if I were you. Yeah. <laughs> so James, you were you were on this professional circuit for the better part of ten years. I'm I'm kind of guessing you weren't 
on an all fired desire to climb up a corporate tree somewhere in, in your business career. How did, how did you, how did you live in those 10 years? What was it, what was it like? <clears throat> um, I, I've always been focused on enjoying life a little bit. I was a salesperson for a pharmaceutical company for a while, for I think three years. I sold computers for a while. Um, and then I got into uh, the pharmaceutical sales part. Um, and that was, you know, I would, I would gear up. I would always swim because it's just what we've always done, right? But never really with a uh, I just swim some and then usually around March I'd be like well you know now I guess am I going to swim this summer am I going to do the races because you know I wasn't sure but then I'm like all right I'll, I'll go ahead and and start training and usually March and April and, and you know how it is if you haven't been training hard and then you train hard usually after three or four weeks you'd get sick for a week so I scheduled that in I'm like I I got to get my workouts and then I know there's going to be a time where I'm not going to be able to work out because I've just worn myself out and then I'll get back in and, and I had a weekly goal a weekly yardage goal usually that I set up and, um, and I'd swim in the morning with this age group team I'd get up I remember at 4 30 and drive over to Alexandria and swim with John Flanagan age group team and I do remember at 31 years old this kid had just turned 18 I said hey happy birthday Teddy and he looks at me he goes yeah eight I said how old are you he goes 18 he goes guess I guess you've seen that come and go <laughs> <laughs> yes I have um and uh you know I was 30 I was probably you know 31 years old so uh at some point I was like uh, you know that's when I'm like you know I've done this long enough but I, but I also I've always, again, been focused on enjoying life and weekends, people, hey, let's go do this. I'm like, no, nah, I'm gonna go do a three hour training swim. And finally, I'm like, how can I do both? So I bought a boat and um, kept it out on the South River at the time. And I just tell my friends, let's, uh, <laughs> if you drive the boat for three hours next to me, um, then I will buy beer for you for the rest of the day and food. And we'll just go out and water ski and, and enjoy. And so, uh, back then it was pretty easy to find friends <laughs> so, to do it what were your what were your best swimming memories and your best adventure memories in that decade um you know they're they're, they're all good um even even the bad ones are good um because it was such a uh i guess just you know Honestly, the best memories are knowing you have this, this brotherhood, this camaraderie with all the other swimmers, um, you know, and after, I think it was about 13 years and they're 12 years in, and I was just about done. And I just, I went and decided to go do that race in Australia and talked my way into it. The race organizer, he's like, well, I don't know, you're pretty inconsistent these days. I'm like, I will, I will train. Trust me, I'll be in shape, you know, because they were giving away a free ticket to get there. I ended up getting, I can't remember if it was second or third, um, and having a, you know, a great race. And then I went over and I traveled around Australia and then I went and stayed with Shelly Taylor for, um, you know, I don't know, five, six weeks, maybe it was to, to train hard to go down to Australia. Uh, I mean, to go to Argentina, I'm sorry, and swim the races there. I had quit my job and decided just to travel and sort of live this sort of funny life of swimming for a while but letting swimming just work for me. Um, I think I trained too hard. I didn't do very well in Argentina. I was in great shape, but I think I forgot to rest, which is always been key for me. And, um, <clears throat> but you know, did a few races down there. And then I went over to, and stayed with Sergio Carandini in Florence and did races up and down the coast of Italy for a while, these kind of local races. And so to me, maybe that was the best time because we, we were, oh, we'll train, but we never did. And we just, we'd go to these races and uh, they were like three or four hour races up and down the coast of Italy, eating amazing food, staying in amazing places and, um, you know, making a little bit of money. But it was more about, uh, we, we just had a, a, there's a lot of laughs. And so they're all, I mean, there's so many, I mean, swimming in Egypt when Sadat was shot in 1981 was, was, amazing because they canceled the second race and again it was when I showed up it was in October I think and there was no uh I wasn't in great shape and so then they just reimbursed us some travel expenses since they canceled the second race so I traveled around Egypt and 
stayed with Abu Heif, the famous, uh, um, he had a second home and he let uh, me and my, uh, my girlfriend at the time stay in this other home. And uh, that dude was funny as heck. <laughs> Did you, did you, did you, uh, was it very clear to you he was a national hero? Was there any doubt about it? Um, were you like the friend of God or something when you were there? Yeah, but, but, you know, he was, he was funny because if, if it wasn't clear, he made it clear. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he was a funny guy. He, he'd set, he took us over to his, the national club, I think it was called, where he would sit there and float. That guy was, uh, he could float. He was amazing. He would float. I have a picture somewhere. I don't know. I should find it probably. But he was reading the paper, sitting, floating, laying back, just floating, reading the paper. In the, in the water. Yeah, in the pool. It might have been a saltwater pool, but regardless, um, that, that was, that's an image that will stay in my mind forever. Um, and, uh, was, that the di was that the difference between him being the world champion and you being one of the top three? Was it that the ability to float and read the newspaper at the same time? You know, Doc Councilman never taught you that, did he? You, you know, you know what the, the big difference was? Is um, one of my, so yeah, the only regret I have, I never learned how to pee while I was swimming. So during a race, I'd have to stop three, four times for a minute, <laughs> at least. And, I, and also, people couldn't be going, come on, come on. I'd have to, I'd have to put my head down in the water just to get silence. And because uh, if people are yelling, go, 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 I'm like, I'm trying to go, but I can't while people are yelling. Um, so that was, uh, that was um, in boats, you know, like. Up we got, we got Asmuth confessing he stiffed you on the second lap. And you're confessing you couldn't pee when you swim. I've seen women who have to turn away so no one can look in their eyes. And I've seen women that force everybody in the boat to look the other direction. And they do something similar. But um, world-class James Kegley couldn't be in the water. That was, uh, that was and you know, it's, it was so funny because <clears throat> people who are cheering for you, like, and, and up in, particularly Magog, you know, there'd be boats next to you. And uh, um, I just got Argentina too. But there was, uh, you know, people, and it was so awesome. And they'd be like giving you, come on, when you're feeling kind of bad at four or five hours. <clears throat> but you're trying to catch somebody or not let somebody else catch you. And, uh, and you're like, Oh gosh, I gotta, you know, you, I gotta pee. This is really uncomfortable. So, so then you'd stop and they'd think you're having a problem. And, like trying to encourage you. And I'm like, you know, how do you, it's like, <laughs> how do you tell everybody? And then it's even worse. Like, Oh, stop. I'm, I'm uh, I've got to pee. So yeah, that was pretty too much. Actually. That was pretty funny. Tell us about, where where you were, what you were thinking when it was announced that the marathon was going to be in the 2008 Olympics? Um, which now, so, so, you know, that's, I sort of saw that coming. I saw the whole, I saw kind of, I saw, I know Sid Cassidy pretty well. And, you know, I know he was very involved in with FINA and, and trying to get, um, open water swimming in, you know, more of an international competition in, in sort of an organized way, as opposed to we were back in the pirate days where things were not really under the auspice, particularly in the, in the United States of any sort of uh, federation, I'd say, which I'm glad <laughs> that, that was fun that way to sort of do it in that uh, unorthodox way. Um, and, you know, it's funny, I had a little bit mixed emotions about that because I'm like, well, you know, they're doing a 10K or, or a 25K and that's not a real marathon because, you know, we're like, we're swimming these long ones, but it is, I mean, it's still, it's amazingly hard. Um, and I also think like the, these, the 25K probably for me would have been a really um, almost a, maybe a perfect distance because I was pretty good for about five hours and then I was, uh, then it was, a, then it was a struggle and I was always waiting for the good times. So I'm, I'm really glad to see open water swimming and, and marathon swimming in the Olympics and in an international competition. And, you know, I think you asked me before, you know, what if, you know, and I don't spend a lot of time with what ifs because uh, life is good. So, you know. <laughs> a lot of the uh, people we've interviewed have talked in um, glowing terms about Atlantic City, about the, the, the three or four different swims all wrapped up in one. 
what, what were your experiences like down there? And did, did you come out saying this is the, the world's greatest swim or did you go on oh, that current at, you know, mile eight killed there? The Atlantic city was an awesome swim. And, and, uh, I love Atlantic city in general. I ended up joining the beach patrol there. Um, when I was in grad school, that was part of, you know, after I realized I didn't want to be a, a salesperson, actually it became, it became one afterwards too. But, um, but, uh, the currents there were, were, could be really tough and really hard. And, and, uh, I mean, you'd end up with like, you know, <laughs> bloody arms and stuff because so my, my, uh, the guys who always were in my boat, rowing my boat, Steve Batzer and George Brestel were local business people who were just doing it because they loved the race and they love Atlantic city and South Jersey. And they would say, you got to hug the rocks. You got to hug the rocks. And they'd be you know, yelling at me. And I'm like, <laughs> but you know, the, the tides are going up and down like the, the waves, like three feet, four feet. So you'd be hugging the rocks and all of a sudden you'd be on these barnacle rocks, you know, so you'd be scraped up and, and, um, but it was the way to fight the, uh, the current. And I, geez, I remember once coming through the, the bridge at the end and, um, it was the year we, it was a year we started on the beach because of the tides. I'm not sure why we started on the beach instead of Gardner's Basin and, we had swum and instead of usually you'd go through that bridge and you'd have like a, a mile left or something or two to the end. And, uh, but this time I knew we had to go through this bridge and around these jetties to get over to the beach side and this bridge, the water was coming through, through so fast that I think Claudio had been ahead of me by what I would consider, you know, 250 yards or meters was pretty far back then to catch that up swimming this long. And all of a sudden I caught him. And because the current had been, he was right there at the bridge. And Claudio was, um, he's kind of the gold standard of marathon swimming um, in terms of that guy has, he had been around. I mean, when we started, he, had, he was already an icon. And, and then, you know, we kept doing it. Now he's still doing them um, and tough. And that guy was mentally tough. And, uh, and I used to watch him swim and Maru would be in the boat and, and screaming. And if we'd be next to each other and, and you could just see him, he was so steady and he was just, you know, steady and smart and tough. And it was amazing to me because I looked at him and he, and I'm like, what are you going to do? And he goes, and he goes, uh, it's the only thing we can. And he started grabbing these spikes sticking out from the bridge, pulling himself through because you couldn't get through the current. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I guess that's what we're doing. And then, and we got through there and you had to be in water this deep to, to get anywhere. So we're kind of like swimming with your elbows kind of to get past this one little spot where the water was going so fast. And I looked at him and I'm like, uh, and he looked at me and I was amazing. He spoke and I said, Claudio, how much further is this going to be like this? <laughs> and he you just invited said, him to psych you out, James. You invited no, him to psych you actually, out. No, but actually he gave me hope. He gave me hope. He said, well, he said, yeah, this is really tough. And I'm like, oh, okay, good. <laughs> it's not just tough for me. You know, this, you know, I don't remember the exact words, but I just remember him, him admitting that it was hard inspired me. And I actually was able to kind of kick into a new gear and, and go faster than, I don't think I've ever told him that, but, um, and Did I, you I beat him. you know, I think I might've, I can't remember the details on that one. I don't, you know, and he uh, remember. No, I, well, you know, I, don't, I have no idea if he would or not. It's, we'll uh, ask him in a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he'll probably, he'll remember it differently, you know. <laughs> he'll remember that I fell apart or something. But, um, you know, I remember having a good end of the race. And uh, it was kind of funny because I did, I don't know what happened, but I, my, my parents um, came occasionally to a race. But my, my parents were on a boat for some reason. They came up and watched. And after the race, my mother said to me, she goes, which is a funny thing to say as a parent of a competitive swimmer their whole life. She goes, wow. She goes, I didn't realize that you were that competitive. <laughs> as in that good. <laughs> well, just I think I, I, I found a gear at the end of a race that it was um, – I kind of taught, you know, I was usually pretty good at end of, in Magog at the end of the race in sprints. I, I had, um, I could swim pretty fast when I knew there was a thousand left. Um, 
<clears throat> and I think that's what I, I kind of dug into at that race. But you know, it, the, that gear wasn't always there, but that, that time it was. Do you have a big picture in your studio of, um, I presume Donald Trump had sponsored one of those Atlantic City races, a big picture of you with the, uh, with the current president of the United States? No, I'm not a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> and when you, when you look at the, um, the swimming today, is this something you follow? Do you follow the Grand Prix and the, and the World Cup and the Olympics? Are you glued to it or is it of, of casual interest? Casual interest, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was an amazing part of my life, and, and a, probably an amazing part of who I am in terms of uh, you learn a lot as as everybody who's probably interested enough to watch these things knows about yourself when you swim a long distance race, and I think in particular when you race a long distance race, because um, there's to me a fairly big difference. You know, racing is is uh, <laughs> racing for money. You know, there's. Uh, you, you ask yourself a lot of questions um, as you're doing that. And uh, I mean, I could go out ahead of time and I do some six hour training swims and, and, and occasionally eight, but as I got older, it was more like five or six just before races, just to sort of get my mind in the right mindset again. Um, but that was so much different than racing. I think I, and I saw Paul's, he's like, you know, on that day, doesn't matter you know you don't pick the day you you're sitting there and there you are and all these other people and you're like all right we're, we're about to embark on this journey and um and uh yeah it was more about you know this journey and uh, that we were all gonna have um and that's where i think the uh there's a a, a respect that goes and steve could probably attest to the same thing you know there's a there's a respect i think that all of the people that we used to race against, and I'm sure this still the current ones have. Um, I think too, back in our days, it was definitely the pirate days of it. And uh, that respect was also that we're all, you know, we didn't have backing um, of our, of any sort of federation. We just sort of went and did it and uh, figured out how to make it work and figured out where to stay sometimes. You know, you'd go to Capri and you know, they'd, they'd have suggested places, but, uh, and I don't know if it's different now, but um, you'd still figure out where you're going to stay and where you're going to eat and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm not even sure what the question was, but here I am rambling. <laughs> Last question for you. Um, in, in earlier conversations, you mentioned uh, a side trip to Nepal. I'm assuming that was part of the adventure, not the swim races. You don't have a, a Mount Everest glacier race story to tell us. No, you know, I, I'd say... Uh, I'd, you know, if there was some body of water, a lot of times I'd go swim and have swim, but I ended up in Nepal just because I ended up in India. I was staying with Anita Sood's family who uh, occasionally I'd stay there and then get myself healthy and well-fed. And then I'd go out and adventure into India. And then I'm like, well, here I should go to Nepal. So, yeah. <laughs> James Kegley, thank you very much for your time today. And we wish you all the best. Thank you. That was fun. <laughs>